Good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you're joining us from. We have some folks joining us online. So if you're joining us from a different part of the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you. My name is Prosper Pony, and I am the Skills Hub Curator. Today, we would be zoning into a very interesting conversation as we celebrate the International Youth Day. We have very with us on the panel during the discussion. We also have a welcome advice that will be delivered by the Executive Director of IOTA. And then we have a partner statement coming up. So as you're in, I'd like for you to put your phone on silence. For those joining us on the live stream, if you're enjoying us and also enjoying the session, kindly comment on the, in the chat box. Let us know how you feel. Let us also know where you're joining us from. Welcome once again to this year's International Youth Day celebration. The topic for today would be on the stakeholder dialogue on the future of work. We have seizing guests who will be sharing their experience on that with us. Without further ado, I'd like for you to give me a round of applause as we welcome the Executive Director, Emmanuel Eduji, to welcome us in. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really a great pleasure to welcome all of you, uh, for those of us who have uh, made it here physically, but also more importantly, all our colleagues and friends who are joining us from um, different locations virtually. Uh, once again, International Youth Day is here with us. Uh, it's a day that uh, enables the global community to reflect on how the world is really going uh, and, supporting and supporting and coordinating its efforts, efforts to, to support, support what I believe is the most important um, cohort or group of people uh, in the, uh, across the planet. Young people, wherever you find them, represent uh, a nation's uh, most, important, most important assets. Uh, take out the exuberance, the energy, the productivity, uh, and, and all of, of the, the good things, things that young people bring to a nation's development, development and you will almost have no development in your country. And so show me any country that has made it economically, any country that we can point to as having made progress in its uh, productivity, in its workforce, in its industrialization uh, agenda, and I would almost vouch that that country tapped the resources that its young people bring. And so let's not take the International Youth Day uh, as an, another annual commemoration, but really as a serious uh, moment. That's what really brings us here today. As we speak, uh, a combination of global factors have, have you know, conspired to bring down the efforts that we have made, the progress that we have made in global youth development. Prior to COVID, I think we all know that Africa was beginning to see some progress in our education systems. Um, we, we saw some progress with uh, basic education all the way to tertiary, uh, although not at the levels that we truly would have wanted. Unfortunately, two to three years of COVID disruption means that in a lot of our economies across Africa, we've come back to square one. Across Africa to our forum two weeks ago uh, have expressed similar sentiments about the ways in which COVID has been disruptive of uh, our youth effort. And so today's conversation is really against that background. What are the ways we can, what are the courses we can take to succeed? What are the sectors of our economies that we can gain some quick wins? What, what are the 
examples of collaborations across sectors, um, from agriculture to agribusiness, uh, or even entrepreneurship, uh, financial inclusion, uh, how about education in itself, that's a whole topic, and the conversation around transition from education to, to work, which is really the missing link that we can have really seasoned guests uh, who have worked in this sector for a very long time. You know that in Ghana, uh, we don't, youth and workforce and skills, uh, it's big in the practitioner sense, so in terms of NGOs and international organizations uh, working in that space. But when it comes to research and uh, the whole focus by think tanks and so on, there's very few. It's a small Niche of people who are working in that space, whether from the World Bank or from ESE or the Department of Economics and so on. Uh, it's a small group of aspects. And so to get uh, several of them to be represented here today, it's really uh, a big achievement. And I want to, even before we start, thank um, Madame Maoko Fume, who has been very key on this conversation if you look at some of the reports that she's done for the World Bank. Uh, on the, uh, later on on the panel, we're going to have uh, Dr. Pala uh, Chumesi Bafo, who, will, who is one of the aspects as well, written extensively on the, the, the whole conversation on skills. Uh, and then, of course, uh, many of you who are familiar with the work that we do at IOTA, you know that we've been partnering in the last two to three years with the Princess Trust International, uh, which is one of the leading global development organizations focusing uh, mainly on young people uh, and what they bring to the development space. And the PTI have released what I believe is one of the few reports that really focuses on the voices of young people. You know, normally when you see uh, a lot of the And it's, it's one of the few reports we have that solely picks the voices and the minds and the perspectives of young people. And I'm so pleased that we can have the CEO, uh, the head, the global lead uh, of Princess Trust International to join us. And so I think clearly uh, we have a rich uh, team of experts and practitioners joining us. But I personally believe you in the room today are the best experts. The young people, the young leaders, colleagues from Yota who are physically here, but also a few who would be uh, joining us on the live link or on Zoom are really the real experts. Some of our, our young people here are entrepreneurs. They are the ones who have been affected directly. They have first-hand uh, experience of how COVID disrupted the small business they started in 2018 and got disrupted in 2020. They are the ones who have, who have had to stay at home for nine months due to school closures. They are the ones who have suffered the, the most of the ravages of COVID-19. So I think that the real aspects in the room And so thank you all for coming. I look forward to what hopefully would be a very lively one and a half hour uh, conversation. Thank you so much. So Emmanuel actually highlighted a few things that we should all take note of. In order for young people to actually excel or get the skills they need, we need to have the right people in the room to have that conversation. And in the panel session, we'll be having those who will be sitting on the stage to share with us what they've been working on and what the report says. We'd like to take a very brief video from our partner. So for the first video, we'll have one for Skills Hub. 
and then we'll take another one. The all-new Multipurpose Skills Hub is supporting young people seeking opportunities to build their dream businesses, gain decent work and transform their lives. The Skills Hub offers incredible services for next to nothing. These services include Youth Enterprise Services where we support you to start, grow and sustain their businesses. Our incubation and acceleration services come with priority access to curated library, mentoring and coaching, as well as business advisory services at the Skills Hub. Youth Employment Services, preparing youth for the world of work and innovative supportive services and facilities providing events and meeting spaces with customer sizable seating capacity of 5 to 65, co-working spaces for young entrepreneurs who may not have office space to operate, high-speed internet cafe, a copy center and others, special packages for the most sought after, entrepreneurship skills, employability skills, digital skills, life skills and financial literacy for individuals and organizations. The Skills Hub is open to every young person who wants to land their dream jobs or contracts. It's time to take charge of your future. Now visit the Skills Hub at Toyota Building at American House Traffic Lights on the La Barleshi Road, East Lagos. Right. Thank you for sharing that video. So if you want to know a bit more about Skills Hub, the video will be up there for you to watch. We would like to actually take a message from the International Program Partner for PTI. She's joining us virtually, so just stick and then hear what she has to say. Let's give it up for Jane Parker as she shares. Thank you, thank you. It's um, great to be here this morning. Um, Emmanuel has asked me to give a very brief introduction to um, our organization and our work in Ghana. So uh, Prince's Trust International was founded by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, to tackle the global crisis and youth unemployment. And we have been supporting interventions and we are committed to amplifying the voices of young people on stage and putting their needs at the very heart of the design and the delivery of our work. So our programs are now present in 17 countries across Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, the Middle East and Europe. And we have supported over 45,000 young people since our inception. Our mission, to empower young people to learn, earn and thrive. In Africa, Prince's Trust International works in Rwanda, Kenya, Nigeria and Ghana. And we've been working in Ghana since the end of 2019, beginning in 2020. And we've supported over 1,000 young, 1,500 young people to date. supporting young people in junior high school soft skills, those life skills that are all received, not only in education, but as they move into adult life. These skills are not currently part of the national curriculum, and employers consistently tell us that young Ghanaians are lacking these essential skills to succeed the world of work. Enterprise Challenge, a program with an partnership with an environment 360, supporting young people in seeding their high skills to develop business and entrepreneurial skills with a focusing on the burgeoning green economy in Ghana. With a lack of paid employment opportunities, many young Ghanaians are looking to set up their own businesses. So learning these essential skills of entrepreneurship and business are really important and really important for young Ghanaians to learn those early. This programme culminates in a green business pitch competition where the winners are given a year of business mentor support and startup capital to develop that business idea. And in partnership with Yotta, 
we ran our Get Into Employment programme, again with a focus on the green sector and with a focus on supporting opportunity youth in Ghana. So young people receive soft skills training and a full week work experience placement, importantly, followed by the opportunity to gain permanent employment with that employer. And to date, young people have gained employment in the growing solar and recycling sectors. Also in partnership with Yotta, we run Vicheck Tertiary. Now, this is a blended program run across three universities in Accra, where young people are enabled to build their confidence and their interview and employer engagement skills through undertaking a series of modules delivered via WhatsApp, culminating in a job fair. The job fair was attended by 390 young people from across those three universities and 12 major employers attended. Those young people were then given the opportunity to secure employment, internship and national service placements. And by the use of the undertaking the uh, vibe check modules, they felt much more confident in being able to engage with those employers and show their, show their best selves, show what they had to had to give, what they had to give the employer. So after continued postponement due to COVID, we were absolutely delighted to be able to hold our Ghana launch event in June at the British High Commissioner's residence with young people, our delivery partners, um, and the key stakeholders working in the youth space, uh, where we were able to showcase this work and importantly, the successes of the young people. So over the last two years, it has been a privilege to work in partnership with Yotta. They are an established, committed and knowledgeable organisation who really understand the myriad of challenges that young Ghanaians face today. Uh, we're really looking forward to continuing this partnership to enable us to expand our reach and grow our programmes over the coming years. So together we can support more young Ghanaians to learn, earn and thrive. And so I'd like to conclude by thanking Emmanuel and his team for inviting us to be a part of this event and these vital discussions today. Thank you. That was a really great, I think she deserves another one. Let's clap for her. Jane. It's always a pleasure working with you and we look forward to doing more projects and touching more lives in Ghana and across the continent. So before we move on to the next item, we want to do something really interesting. Today being International Youth Day, we want to actually arouse ourselves that anthem, that song that inspires us. So join me when I start chanting. All right. Can we be on our feet? Let's do it. Those in-house, those joining us online, please be up and join me as we sing Arise Ghana You. Two, one. Arise Ghana Youth for your country. Your nation demands your devotion. Let us We are all involved. We are all involved in building a motherland. Let's give it up for ourselves with a round of applause. Thank you very much. Please resume your seat as we progress with the program. I feel really energetic this morning. I see most of you feel the same. As I mentioned earlier, we have some delegations or guests joining us on the panel. I'd like to welcome in the presence Maoko Fume. She is the social protection and job advisor with World Bank Group. And joining us as well as Dr. Priscilla Chumesi-Bafo, 
She is a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Department of Economics. <laughs> they all have a long, you know, intro, and I'll leave that to the panelists' session to do that. We also have Vera Ado from Oxfam joining us. We're looking forward to getting our other guests joining us. As soon as they come, we'll introduce them to all of us. So let's take the next presentation. This would be from the CEO of PTI in the person of Will Straw. So let's go online and then watch what Will has for us. Some slides, so I'll just um, share my screen, um, and uh, um, hopefully uh, you'll be able to see these come up. Um, hope, hope those have come up. Um, so uh, the agenda um, for, for my areas. Um, and I'll go through these fairly rapidly, but I'm very happy to circulate the slides afterwards. Um, and uh, the, these um, slides uh, support a, uh, a new report that we published um, in, uh, in late June. Uh, so you can find that report, uh, which is called an upskill struggle uh, on our website. And there's also a short video um, as well, um, if you're time pressed. But um, let me kick off with um, the methodology that we adopted. Um, so, um, as, uh, as Emmanuel said, this is a report that really seeks to understand young people's perspective on the future of work, um, their hopes and aspirations for the future, and what they need from uh, governments, businesses, and civil society organisations like Prince's Trust International and Yotta. Um, we involved young people from 12 countries. Uh, the report obviously includes a literature review covering uh, many of the um, latest thinking on this area, including from the International Labour Organisation. Um, we surveyed just over 10,000 young people uh, using a company called YouGov, uh, and uh, they surveyed uh, young people in, in 10 countries. Uh, and then we carried out focus groups in an overlapping uh, group of countries. So in total, covering the, the views of young people in 12 countries, including, of course, uh, Ghana uh, and the UK. And you can see on the map there some of the other places around the world. Um, these young people were aged 18 to 35, um, and uh, the um, majority uh, of them were in a, in a single uh, job. Uh, some in multiple jobs, about a quarter in full-time education or training, uh, and then maybe 20% who are not in employment education or training. So uh, a sort of broad cross-section of, uh, of young people. Um, in terms of the headline findings, um, we found that young people um, are optimistic about the future, um, despite um, you know, what is quite a troubling uh, situation that, uh, that they face. Um, obviously, we're all conscious of uh, coming out of the for young people, but they are positive about the future and, and, uh, and, and therefore need uh, support. And I think that the key thing they need support in uh, is gaining uh, the skills to um, fulfill their uh, potential. We asked about the impact of, of COVID, um, and um, this is obviously um, against the, the backdrop of um, what UNESCO have described as the worst education crisis on record, with 1.6 billion learners uh, affected by school closures around the world, uh, estimates of the, the loss in lifetime earnings of uh, around 14% of global GDP, um, and 7 in 10 children aged uh, 10 um, facing learning poverty. Uh, and of course, in terms of youth unemployment, we know from the International Labour Organization that um, youth unemployment has run at three times the level of general unemployment around the world. Uh, and uh, one in four young people cannot find jobs that pay more than $1.25 a day. Um, so in the, in, in the research that we did, uh, young people saying that um, COVID was mentally draining. Uh, that was a young person from, uh, from New Zealand. Um, and in the survey, um, a third of uh, young uh, people told us that they were in countries um, you know, where, where they lost their jobs during the pandemic. And you can see here that 
Ghana uh, just slightly higher than average in terms of the number of young people who lost employment um, in their in their countries. But um, you know, this this being something that affected young people right around the world, um, and uh, uh, astonishing, eighty percent of young people saying that their um, education uh, was uh, was affected negatively. Um, although many were able to continue um, learning remotely or online. Um, so, you know, it really has been a devastating time for young people. Uh, and, uh, you know, for those trying to join remotely, uh, I think this quote about the challenges of joining um, because of uh, lack of devices and limited internet um, speaks for, for many uh, around the world. Um, on the other hand, we found that some people um, were able to reevaluate what they wanted to do. Um, this person uh, saying they've sort of refocused what they wanted to do um, during the uh, during the pandemic. So then, what about the the future of work? What are what are young people uh, interested in? Well, we found that um, young people have a significant interest in the jobs of the future. Um, Seventy three percent interested uh, in in green jobs. 68% in digital jobs, 61% in jobs in health and social care. Uh, I should say that uh, in Ghana, um, there were even higher percentages for these uh, sectors. Um, also a high degree uh, of interest in um, young people working for themselves, whether that's uh, as entrepreneurs or self-employed uh, or as uh, freelancers. 50% um, you know, here interested in working as a contractor, 70% uh, as, a, as a freelancer, 75% um, as, uh, as starting their own business or company. And of course, we know that entrepreneurship is going to be so important to uh, dealing um, with the longstanding youth employment challenges that uh, many continents face, particularly those with significant demographic challenges. And some quotes here sort of bringing this to life. So a young person in Rwanda uh, saying how everything's becoming digital uh, and that the skills are needed. Uh, someone else in the UK um, saying that, uh, you know, they can see that companies are not going to get away with greenwashing in the future and are going to have to go genuinely green and that that therefore creates job opportunities. Uh, and then someone from Barbados saying they believe entrepreneurship um, is, uh, is the way forward because they can adapt to circumstances uh, and they value the flexibility that it brings. So entrepreneurship offering opportunities both for uh, a, a better lifestyle potentially as well as a form of income. So what do young people need to realise these opportunities? Um, we asked young people about a range of different uh, things that might be important to them, including uh, a high school diploma, uh, which 76% uh, schooling, literacy and numeracy, digital literacy, and then these employability skills, uh, things like self-confidence, communications, teamwork, uh, resilience, problem solving, and so on, and very much the bread and butter of what Yotta and indeed Prince's Trust International focuses on. And, and these came out very, very highly uh, from young people. Um, and, you know, when, when we um, delved down in the focus groups, someone from Australia um, saying that it was um, you know, really important to develop these so-called soft skills involving teamwork and leadership, clear communication. Um, but um, we, we found out that um, uh, around um, you know, a third of, uh, third of young people uh, thought that the education system uh, in their countries was not providing um, the, uh, the skills that prepare them for the world of work. I mean, it's devastating, the statistics here for the UK, over 50% of young people saying that the education system is not preparing them for the world of work, uh, and just shy of 40% in, in Canada uh, and the US. In Ghana, sort of in the middle of the picture there, um, uh, reflecting where the rest of the world is, but really troubling that, uh, that one in three young people of those we surveyed around the world um, don't believe their education system is supporting them. And we regard this really as being the, you know, one of the key insights from this, uh, from this report. Um, so we asked, you know, what, what is it that governments uh, could do to support you? And um, you know, we gave young people a range of answers, asked them to pick the, uh, the most important to them. And one in five said that it was ensuring that schools teach skills that are relevant uh, to the world of work. Um, others focused on uh, providing a job guarantee startup grants for entrepreneurs, making higher and further education uh, more affordable. 
Um, and then just to sort of bring this out, an Australian uh, participant saying that there was uh, too much focus on content-based learning, rote learning, and there wasn't enough room for learning skills as opposed to knowledge. I think that young person spoke for many uh, in how they uh, described um, the, 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 the lack of support that they uh, faced. We also asked what support from businesses would be most valuable. And here, uh, about one in four said that offering more entry-level roles for those without qualifications and experience was important. Um, we, we talk here about the importance of um, employers giving young people a chance. And uh, I think we found that there was a real catch-22 where young people um, weren't able to uh, join entry-level positions because they didn't have relevant experience, but of course couldn't gain that experience without those entry-level roles. Others that came out strikingly were around clear pathways for career progression, better employment rights, higher entry wages, uh, and more entry-level roles uh, for those with uh, higher education uh, qualifications. Um, young person from Rwanda uh, sort of describing this catch-22 to saying, you know, when seeking a job, they ask you for experience and you cannot have experience when you have not started working. So areas for action. Uh, we uh, ha sort of highlighted three really important areas. One in education, as mentioned about making it more relevant to the modern workplace. Uh, second, in relation to employment, giving young people a fair chance uh, in the workplace, um, giving young people uh, an opportunity to, to join uh, those entry level positions. Uh, and thirdly, um, in relation to entrepreneurship, offering young people more support to, to work for themselves, whether that's in the form of startup grants, loans, mentorship, uh, and, uh, and so on. So, I mean, that brings my um, presentation to a conclusion. I know we're going to discuss it in the, um, in, in the panel now, um, but um, I think the, um, the, the key takeaway for us is that um, young people are, are really optimistic uh, about um, their future. Uh, we, we found in the report, for example, young people thinking that they could um, you know, help uh, tackle many of the challenges that face the world, but clearly needing support, needing support from government, from business, from civil society. So we all have a really clear role to play here. Uh, I think uh, organisations like Yotta, I hope Prince's Trust International as well, um, playing a, a critical role uh, in doing that, but uh, but of course we can't do it alone, and that's why partnerships are so important. Um, so I'll leave it there, and um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Will. That was a very impressive report. So the report is actually an upskill struggle supporting a generation of untapped potential. I want to see if you remember something from this report. Let me just pick on you. What were the three recommendations that they made based on the report? Just three recommendations. If you're on the video, you can add that and share. If you're in-house, just echo it. We want to hear one. That's impressive. Education was one. The second one. Say that again. Give young people a fair chance in the workplace. Can we have the last one? The last one, then we go into our panel discussion. Okay. So whilst you think about that, we'll have our panel discussion going. It will be maximum 45 minute conversation. So to do that, we'd like to welcome Mr. Eric Safaro, who is a skills and innovation lead at Yota, to introduce our panelists for this session. So give a round of applause to yourselves too. You deserve that. Well, International Youth Day is an opportunity for us to really celebrate um, young people and also to really have pertinent conversation concerning issues 
that bother young people as well. And so for this conversation that we're going to have, um, this panel discussion, we have seasoned guests who are joining me here in the Skills Hub and also online as well. And so in order to really strike that kind of rapport with our young people in studio and online, I'll just invite our guests on stage and then get them to really interact with the young people. And so to help me welcome our guest on stage, the first I want to welcome is Malko Fumi, who is the social protection. Yes, please. Oh, give it up to Malko as she comes to the studio. Please take your We'll get to hear more about Malco um, in, in a bit. Um, and our second guest that I'd like you to also um, really appreciate as she comes on stage is Dr. Presla Chumesi Bafo from the University of Ghana. Oh, please do it well as young people. You can even give a little bit of a shout. You understand? Yes. We do it best when it is noisy and colorful as young people. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. And also joining us online, we have um, Will, Will Stroll, who is the CEO of Princess Trust International. <laughs> All right. And so to really get to know our guest here, first of all, I want to say a big thank you to all our guests. It was a last minute uh, arrangement and our guest had to really put all things aside to join us here. So please do it one more time for them. <laughs> Just to tell you about the sacrifices they had to make, uh, Marco literally had to put everything on hold. And Dr. Balfour had to really just finish a lecture, just try the lecture, and then rush here for the conversation just for you. And, and so thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, you being here as well. This discussion, I am just a moderator. You get to ask the question, so prepare your questions. We are going to talk about the future of work, the future of work, and from the uh, research that will introduce to us, we got to really hear what COVID has done and the effect of COVID. And even before COVID, we had issues with employment or unemployment of young people. And so this is what we're going to discuss. So put together your thoughts and all that. But before we get into the meaty part of the whole um, conversation, I'd like to start with um, Dr. Chumesi Bafo. Can you please tell us a bit about yourself, who you are and what you're doing? currently and how you really love to really write about young people and unemployment there. So please, you have one minute to do that for us. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to say I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited. Um, my name is Priscilla Chumesi Bafo, like you've already heard. I am a senior lecturer at the Department of Economics. I am not too young. I have taught for some time. I think I am in my 14th year at the university. Um, so uh, my area of specialization, I'm a labor economics by um, training. Um, so that is what I do. Issues of employment and unemployment is what gives me employment. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so yeah, my research interest recently, um, I'm working on a project, actually the project just came to an end with IDRC, where we are looking at where the conversation of training is going, and we've seen that soft skills is critical, like um, Will indicated in his um, study. And so we did an experiment in Ghana, selecting a number of graduates, final year students at the University of Ghana, KNUST and UCC to train them in soft skills to see whether it makes an impact in their outcome after their national service, whether it increases their employability. And the evidence is quite telling that soft skills is, makes a lot of difference in graduate education. So we are advocating that probably the tertiary institutions should find alternative ways to include such training in the training of our young people as they enter the labor market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please give it up for Dr. Chumesi Bafo. 
Yes, Mark. Thank you very much for. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Mauko Fumi, and I'm working currently with the World Bank Group as a social protection and jobs consultant. So um, I start, I've been working in the development space for over two decades now, and I'm thankful to my very first boss who gave me the chance uh, at the entry level to manage a nationwide project. Just immediately after school, after my bachelor's, I did my master's, and then I had no job experience. But I don't know what he saw, and he taxed me with that assignment to manage a US 800 project, which was nationwide. And I held on to that challenge. Of course, with support from my, my, my employer, he believed in me. I don't know what he saw. So uh, Mr. John Mason, wherever you are, I'm grateful to you. And so I, I experience, built my capacity. I moved on to work with uh, the Netherlands and have grown over the years. So I would like to encourage all of us here we have the potential to grow. We have the potential to grow so long as we have the interest to build our capacity and to work towards changing our own lives and other people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malco. <laughs> Talking about the potential that we have um, to grow and then the importance of soft skills in there. Uh, can we hear from Will Straw as well? Um, just intro introduce yourself to us and then just connect with us as young people. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so um, I'm as uh, um, introduced Will Straw, CEO of Prince's Trust International. Um, I've been in this role for um, nearly two years now, um, and uh, had the great pleasure to visit Ghana um, in June um, with my colleagues uh, Jane and, and Tuto, who's also uh, on the uh, on the call today, um, and uh, um, spent time with Emmanuel. Uh, and, uh, and our other partners as well. Um, and then to um, re-meet with Emmanuel at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in, uh, in um, Rwanda uh, later in June, where we were able to bring together some of our partners from around the Commonwealth, uh, from Nigeria, Kenya, uh, Ghana, of course, Rwanda, India, and Pakistan. And what I think was so uplifting about that event was that um, in the Commonwealth, 60% uh, of the total population of around 2.2 billion are under 30. Uh, and of course, across the, the wider world, that is true as well. You know, it's, it's a cliche, but it's also true to say that young people are our future. And uh, young people are making up a, a greater proportion of the global population than ever before. So um, those of us who are um, reaching middle age or in middle age, uh, in, uh, in, in my case, um, are uh, in increasingly dependent uh, on, uh, on young people um, who will, uh, of course, drive our economies forward uh, and help the world to tackle some of the very significant challenges that we face, whether that's climate change, uh, conflict, um, the need for development. Um, so the great pleasure, I think, in, in working for an organization focused on youth employment um, is the opportunity to, to spend time with young people, to hear about their uh, aspirations, their hopes, their ambitions, and to play a small part in uh, helping them to shape their futures through the programs uh, that we provide. That, that's what gets me up in the morning uh, every day, and it's what makes joining panel discussions like this, marking International Youth Day, uh, such a great pleasure. Great, thank you very much. As we can see, they are not youth, but they are youth at heart. I think when I saw all of them, they look youthful, but as they say, <laughs> 
we all look youthful and so for me my white um as you can see does not make me a youth but i'm youth at heart all right so let's delve into the discussion um for today um there's a world bank report that actually states that every year the education system changes out 210,000 young Ghanaians who are, mark my words, unskilled and semi-skilled into the labor market. So every year, so if we count five years, we have about a million young people who get into the labor market um, unskilled and semi-skilled in there. And they are struggling to really find jobs. COVID has exacerbated the issue. Uh, and so if I should put you on the spot, Dr. Chumensi Bafo, why is it not a disservice to get young people unskilled into the labor market um, by the education system, since you are from academia. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that's a tough one. So indeed, if you look at, if you talk about unskill, what is the perspective um, that you are coming from? Um, you, you usually hear people bashing educational systems as not um, being up to um, scratch to equip people with the requisite skills. Yes, I believe that there are challenges in the educational system. But um, if you ask me, um, for example, um, you meet young people that are going through school, sticking by the books and not doing anything extra, for example. You have situations where you have young people in a uh, universities, for example, who do not even know how to send emails. And I say that it is not your lecturer that will teach you how to send an email. There are certain things that you learn out of your own initiative as you go through the mail. So for example, you don't know how to do something. You see somebody do it, you adapt. So indeed, if you ask, the quality of the education is problematic because of the challenges we have with the infrastructure. But that said, I believe that there's a, a lot of responsibility also on young people to take their destinies into their own hands, to invest in their skills that they are needed. On the part of government, the issue therefore that comes up is what is government doing in terms of policy initiative to ensure that the public sector, the private sector, sorry, is thriving and creating employment opportunities for young people that we churn out onto the labor market every year. Indeed, when you look at um, the Ghanaian economy a couple of decades ago, we were very, um, what do we call it, fertile, with a, a very high fertility rate. But because of lack of planning, we did not anticipate that all those young babies that that were being born will enter the labor market at some point. And that is the situation we are in right now. And it has also been compounded by COVID and its attendant negative implications. Great. So taking responsibility as stakeholders, whether you are a student or you are a parent or you are government or private sector, we are all stakeholders in education and we all have to take responsibility. You ended with uh, COVID uh, really creating um, or adding to the situation. And so, uh, Will, do you want to talk a bit about how COVID has really affected um, the labor market or the world of work for young people for that matter? Putting the um, study in perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think there are um, some very significant negatives from the last two and a half years, but some positives as well that's important to reflect on. Um, I mean, the negatives are that um, young people were um, the, the most dispensable from employers, sadly. Um, so um, we saw uh, from the International Labour Organization that the rate of youth unemployment is running three times higher than uh, for the rest of the population around the world. That's a picture that's um, pretty common, uh, whichever country you look at. And of course, there are some countries uh, like, uh, like the UK and the US that have had much lower rates of unemployment um, during the pandemic, um, but uh, even so youth unemployment is, is higher. Um, so that's been a, a devastating impact. And of course, 
I think for young people who had not finished their education, um, school closures, university closures have had the most profound impact on uh, on, on young people's development. Uh, you know, I'm seeing um, with my own kids who are eight and six, um, how uh, they have lost out um, and uh, how indeed, you know, friends of them in their class uh, who for whatever reason um, don't have such a stable uh, home life um, have, have really missed out during the pandemic uh, and those in lower income households who might not have had access to um, to computers and data um, really, really struggled. And of course, all, all um, young people have missed out on the social side of education, the forming of relationships, the uh, the cultural aspects of education. Um, so, you know, it, that, that's time that young people are, are really going to struggle to get back. On the other hand, um, we are now um, learning uh, about different ways of working. I think um, the pandemic accelerated some, some trends in the labour market, um, which um, we'd started to see um, but prior to the pandemic, but have, have really moved forward. And of course, um, you know, home working, remote working uh, is uh, is one of those. Um, you know, before the pandemic, the technology would have been there for me to join this panel uh, this morning, um, and indeed uh, for Jane to um, you know be able to um, to present from home. But we we might not have done it. We might not have had the confidence in the technology uh, or the initiative to do it and what we're finding now is that um, you know workplaces are increasingly flexible we recognize the importance of bringing people together and that human contact but also the, the flexibility and efficiency of allowing remote working and, and home working uh, people doing their jobs uh, from overseas much more efficiently and, and I think these are changes that are, are going to be welcomed um, right uh, right around the world and you know what we have found um, um, with our programs is that there's no substitute for face-to-face -face, uh, working, face-to-face uh, -face, uh, delivery, but there is definitely a supplementary role for digital and online delivery. And uh, we found that, for example, with our Vibe Check program, which Jane mentioned earlier, and which was delivered by Yotta, where um, ultimately we were preparing young people for a face-to-face -face jobs fair, where they'd have the opportunity to meet employers, um, but they could carry out the modules using their devices, um, using WhatsApp, at their own pace, um, at their own place. And uh, that is an initiative that um, we're really proud of and I think will become increasingly useful in the future. So you know, we shouldn't, um, in, in summary, we shouldn't uh, underestimate the profound impact, particularly for young people from the pandemic uh, in terms of income, education, mental health, uh, and so on. But there are some positives as well uh, that we need to take out of it as well. Great, thank you very much, um, Will. Um, talking about the the opportunities and then the advantages that um, came out as a result of um, COVID, especially the tech drive and all that. When we look at young people, Malco, we have young people who are not in employment and not in education. We have young people who are currently in, a, uh, in employment and those who are in education as well. And when COVID hit, um, there was a new way of working um, in the Given the new way of working where technology came to the fore, um, we started using Zoom, people were hearing Zoom for the first time, and, and all of that. In our context as Ghana, what is the barrier, or what are some of the barriers for young people who may not have had these opportunities to learn how to use the technologies that be to work? Uh, how would you say it affected those who are not even um, educated enough or literate enough to be able to use these technologies for work, those who were even at work and were struggling, and those who are even also in education. Thank you very much. So um, as we have heard, COVID presented both the positive and negative sides. And for the negative aspect, I, I would say that most of us young people were not prepared um, with digital skills right from our uh, education. Even for those who were at work, who were employed, we, we realized that not everybody was really technology savvy. And so when COVID came, we quickly had to adjust to respond to the new uh, demands. Mainly because our training does not provide the opportunity 
for us to be technology savvy right from the primary through to the tertiary level. And then we also have a situation where for most of us, access to the technology, especially in those in rural areas, even those um, who have access to smartphones are very limited. We have a lot of people who would only have access to the, um, the small phones and use to transact their uh, mobile money transactions. And it ends to technology is a big deal. And in addition, we need to learn how to use the technology. So those are some of the barriers that we had to confront. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with COVID, COVID actually gave us a glimpse as to what the future of work looks like. Um, in the, and Dr. Chumis Bafo, I know you've done some work around looking at what sectors in our economy um, actually have the opportunities to give more employment to young people in the next, say, 10, 20 years to come. And so what does the future of work really look like in our Ghanaian context for the young person? Okay, thank you once again. So like um, I, I started um, by looking at um, maybe, so uh, the basic development trajectory of nations, right, um, at the very start of development, everybody is involved in agriculture, we organize our lives around agriculture, subsistence, then some sale and all that. As the economy is transforming due to external influence, the expectation is that we'll begin to add value to agriculture and move into basic manufacturing and then later into sophisticated things and then we move into services. The data we find for Ghana and most African countries is obviously that the middle, which is the manufacturing and the industrial bits, which is supposed to create the needed jobs for young people, is not expanding and that you find a lot of people moved into services. The challenge with the service sector is that the activities they are doing there are not your high-end activities. It's basically buying and selling. And these are not decent jobs that can provide good livelihoods for young people. So in the work that you cited, we were looking at, given that this is the trend we find in Ghana and in most developing countries, in the midst of technological advancements, are there alternatives that countries like Ghana can follow that our development trajectory will not necessarily be like the East Asian Tigers? So we're exploring opportunities for developing countries to chart a new course. And so we look at agro-processing, for example, tourism, that these are areas, and even telecommunication, these are areas that have provided opportunities that we can tap into train young people along the value chain to create jobs. So that is what um, the report is about. And then in that report, we also did a survey of firms, and we found that there are skill gaps that exist. Even within existing firms, skill gaps in the area of technical skills, there's a lack in there. In the area of digital skills, you find a lot of young people holding gadgets and all that. But most of them are doing very minimal things. Social media, that's about it. They are not exploring other things in ways they can use it to be more productive. So the scale gap is there. And like Maoko indicated, the educational institutions are supposed to be a starting point for people to learn. Um, we hope that as most of these studies and advocacies are going on, policies will be put in place and more importantly, investment will be made in that area so that young people in Ghana can be competitive as young people anywhere in the world because the world of work has changed. Now you can sit in Accra and work elsewhere remotely and that is what COVID brought to us. So we know that it is possible but it's for us to do ourselves um, a good service by investing in the young generation so that they take the opportunity as and when it comes. 
Thank you very much. So as we were talking about um, investing in young people, um, I want to come to you, Malco. But before I come to you, um, audience, please prepare your first round of questions that you're going to ask so we can also be part of the whole conversation. Um, what does um, private sector or what can private sector do um, in supporting this skills gap um, that we have in there because I had an experience once at the University of Ghana where um, a company comes to one department, looks at their lab and want to collaborate and say, your lab is uh, old century lab so we can't collaborate with you in a sense. And so in this case, what can the private sector do to really be a part in the process of supporting young people um, with their upscaling? So I think that the, the private sector has a huge role to contribute to this whole process. F from the, the point of uh, even bringing on board young people at entry level, giving them the chance to be part of their system to learn and also to be trained to, to acquire those necessary skills to, to thrive within the workplace. The, the private sector needs to open up and also partner with training institutions to provide the areas, specific areas where the, the, the labor market needs because they determine, in fact, it is uh, recorded that the private sector employs about 90% of um, the young people. So they need to also partner a lot with training institutions to also come up with, okay, the specific areas that are needed uh, by the institutions, such that young people can be trained in those areas. So they have a huge role in this whole um, support process to bring up young people with specific, um, how do you say, the, even with the soft skills, yes, yes. the soft skills, because once they allow young people to, to get in there, they should also provide the necessary training in leadership training, teamwork. I mean, they should be flexible enough to, to bring on board the young people to, to contribute to their capacity. But then they, they also have areas where they complain that young people come in and they are not ready to tune in to the environment. Young people think life is easy. They are not ready to learn, but then they want to enjoy uh, certain positions, benefits. So it's a win-win position. The private sector would have to open up, be flexible, bring on board the young people, provide training. But at the same time, young people should also be ready to learn and to contribute and to work hard such that they can as well benefit from the relationship. Great. Um, I think in, in Will's uh, presentation, he mentions the catch-22. I think it's, a, it's an English um, phrase where the young people go and then seek for employment. They say, you need experience. And they are saying, I haven't worked before, so how do I get experience? So without experience, you can't work. And without the work, you can't get experience in that regard. So um, Will, how do organizations such as PTI, IOTA, and other civil service organizations, what role can they really play in supporting or putting the kind of pressure on either government, academia, and then the private sector to get them to really get young people into employment? Um, great question, Eric. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a great believer in um, show, don't tell. And I think the work of Yotta um, is uh, a great example of how to support young people into the labour market um, to, to help them gain 
uh, the um, employability skills, life skills, soft skills, whatever you want to call it, um, and to demonstrate to businesses and governments that the approach that Yotta takes, that Princess Trust International takes, is superior to what is provided um, by governments and business acting alone. Um, what we found um, around the world, um, but particularly with our Get Into uh, employability program, which is um, what, what Yotta delivers in Ghana, is that the feedback that we get from employers is that the young people who um, who join their companies, having come through our program, are much more likely to be retained um, than the uh, young people or anyone that they recruit um, through other means. So I think what that demonstrates is that there is this very significant skills gap, but it is surmountable and that um, organisations working together with a track record of delivering life skills training uh, can help young people to um, get what they need to be employable, but can also help uh, companies to um, find young people who can um, help address some of the significant skills shortages that they face. So any employers in the room or listening, I would say, uh, get in touch with Yotta and see how you could get involved uh, in the uh, program um, that we run together or in Yotta's other programs and invest in it. Um, you know, don't see this as being, uh, you know, a philanthropic uh, area, but see this as being an absolutely core part of your human resources strategy, because otherwise you're missing out on a generation of talent. Um, and uh, if we work together, we can ensure that there's a win-win for the young people and for the businesses. Thank you very much. So we, we're talking about the soft skills that support young people, and which seems to be uh, the skills that are required for the uh, future of work in here. Now, I'd like to take a couple of questions from the audience. And so if we have audience here who, want, who have questions, I'll take a couple, um, and that could be addressed to... Dr. Chumesi Balfo or Malko or Will. Um, so any questions from the audience that we can take? You can also have it online so that we, we, uh, we will be able to read it for you as well. Do we have some questions online? Yes. OK. Uh, this person says that, this person is actually from Mali. Um, he says, in continuing from the panel's discussions or contributions and the power of importance of partnerships, can you recommend how we can develop better partnerships with all players in youth empowerment, bringing everyone around the table and in partnership, government, private sector, and the youth sector as well? So, looking at key stakeholders and how we can really partner um, into that. Thank you for your question. I think this is Tuto. Um, actually, it actually leaves us. Oh, this is Tuto from PTI. Ah, right, right, right. OK, so um, the question from Tuto is, can you recommend how we can develop better partnerships with all players in the youth empowerment sector? So um, we are looking at government, private sector, and then the youth sector. Um, in the Marco, do you want to take that and then maybe um, Dr. Chumesiba for as well? Okay. So I think we, we need to begin to do things differently. Um, for example, uh, with our education and training institutions, even in curriculum development, I mean, all stakeholders should sit around the table to agree on, I mean, what are the areas that are really high in demand for young people to be, to be trained in. It should start from that level where collectively we determine for the future where uh, uh, um, the skills training should go in terms of narrowing the skills gap. Also, we should also bring the private sector, especially for those who are into entrepreneurship, bringing on board like the financial institutions, business service providers, who can help support young people who are into entrepreneurship. There's a lot of gap and a lot of need for support for young people to grow their businesses. 
And so even in those areas, we sh should begin to come together as stakeholders from government, even when we're designing government programs. We should have all these stakeholders sit around the table to design programs that will meet the needs of the young people. And I must say that the young people should be in the center stage. They should indicate their needs. They should come out and express the specific areas that they will require support, such that together with other stakeholders, programs can be designed to suit their needs. I think we can start from that point. Great. Um, Dr. Chumis Balfour, I used to hear stories when I was in Legon that um, before graduation or during graduation, you had companies coming to line up and looking for students to hire. And I wish it happened in my day, but it never did. Um, and so <laughs> I was a bit disappointed. But can we get to that point where private sector, industry, um, other sectors are uh, fully collaborating with academia, collaborating with government, collaborating with the young people and other institutions to really provide um, an essential support for these young people? Absolutely. Uh, I believe that um, a more structured coordination between all stakeholders, government, educational institutions, private sector, NGOs that are operating within this space are all important in um, uh, particularly addressing most of these challenges. And so, for example, like curriculum, I, I get a bit, I, I think that there I would be a bit more careful. We need that collaboration, but our education should not be solely driven by um, the private sector, in the sense that private sector um, is incentivized by profits. What if today they need people with, I mean, digital skills? Tomorrow they need people with hard skills. It takes time for those trainings to be done, but indeed they need to make an input. So for example, you have a situation where um, because in the humanities, for instance, people are known to get good jobs and all that, um, you find that a lot of people troop into that area for training. And like you said, years ago, companies were lining up to employ people because the supply of the educated people then was very limited given the demand. Now you have the situation where the supply is outstripping the demand. So in that sense, we still need to train people in setting core skills. If you say that the private should give us an agenda for training at the university, then possibly some courses will not be taught. But those courses are also important. We need people to tell our history. Our history, we need to know as a people where we have come from, and that will inform where we are going. But those types of training are not attractive in the private sector because they don't yield profits. So the collaboration is there, but we need to um, hasten with caution, but definitely they need that input, particularly in the area of entrepreneurship, um, like you indicated. A lot of the times we assume that people lack finances, that is why they cannot venture into it. But when you go into studies, you realize that sometimes it is not finance, it is the lack of financial education they, they do not have. That is why their businesses are not thriving and all that. But certainly, collaboration with stakeholders to make an input and there the role of the youth is important. You don't need to be told what you need. You know what you need. And I think that the youth should be given a center stage in all those collaborations to voice out their needs at that point. Yes. Great. On BBC last week, I actually heard that in Asia, especially in China, um, there's a new trend where they're using influencers to market. And so influencer marketing is where uh, a celebrity or an influencer who is more popular on social media is doing a live, um, uh, what you call it, live advert for a product. And the products are selling in millions uh, in there. And so academia now moves into to really find out what exactly is happening with this kind of um, 
market and be able to understand it and create a course around it so that they can help um, develop something that young people can really work with. So I understand the part about academia has to tread with caution, but the future of work is also coming in very fast. So where do we draw the line and how do we move forward? On that note, I want to take another question from the audience and then we can move on to the next phase and wrap up. Any question? I think I saw a hand somewhere. Yes, there. Good morning, once again. My name is Jason, and my question goes directly to Mrs. Bamford. Uh, when she was speaking, she said that students are the stakeholders to their education. But here is the fact that Many students today do not believe in what they learn in, uh, in school. They, they say that they, they are not relevant to the job market. So what can you say about that? Thank you. Thank you, Jason. What do you believe? Do you <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you ask me, the theories we teach, are they relevant? <laughs> um, some people think that it is a waste of time. But trust me, it is not. Why is it not? Um, you are developing cognitive skills there, right? So if your lecturer, for example, comes to class to come and teach, maximization in economics. The whole idea is that you are utilizing some resources efficiently, right, to produce a certain good. You want to get the maximum out of it. But when you enter the labor market to work, you are not going to do maximization there as you were taught in class, but you still apply it. You still apply in the sense that the company would not would always be finding ways to cut costs, would always be finding ways to get the maximum out of it. And that is why, for example, you are not supposed to get to work late because your time is precious to the company. So you will not necessarily find the things you are being taught in class verbatim or whatever in the practical space. But the whole idea of tertiary education is to create a class of people who are quite malleable and you can fit anywhere. And that is why you find somebody doing biological science in the university and would end up in a financial institution. So with the training and the rigor you have received, with very minimal supervision and training on the job market, you should be able to fit anywhere. But for the limited technical, sophisticated areas like medicine and those engineering areas that you require specific training, a graduate, whether you studied history, classics, English, French, you should be able to fit anywhere with minimum supervision. And that's um, being able to fit is when you have invested your time to learn and go through the rudiments of the training you've been given. So you are given an assignment, you have to go and research and write on it. You go to work, your boss will give you something to write. So it is all about trying to create um, this class of people who with minimum supervision can fit anywhere. That is what tertiary education, at least at the, um, the bachelor's degree level, tries to do. Great, so this question is from Mark Edu Jemfi from our Facebook. Mark is asking, how can the youth graduating these days and those already out there can get better future work? How can this already graduated youth get skills to be equipped to gain earning for their living? This is from Mark Edu Jemfi. I think it's for any of the panelists. Okay, so, if you ask me, I would say that young people these days 
do not like to volunteer, for example, to acquire work experience. If you need work experience to give you an edge so that you become more employable, and there's an opportunity to volunteer, to acquire the experience, why don't we do it? That is one way of acquiring the necessary skills to be able to gain uh, employment. So let us be ready to invest in building our own capacity. It is difficult. They might not pay you. You need to depend on your parents for your transport, for example, in and out and all that. But then you should tell yourself that I need this, I need to do this to be able to have an edge because we have a situation where it is difficult now to get that entry level opportunity because the numbers are huge. And so if you get the opportunity to volunteer, I mean, go online, research, you find a lot of organizations that are doing beautiful things. And if you are malleable to acquire more skills, build yourself, I think that is one way of acquiring work experience to give you an edge. Thank you. Let's take our last question. Oh, okay, we have more questions coming up. Yeah. We'll take um, a couple of them. We'll take both questions and then we will continue. So please go for ahead. Okay, good morning, everyone. Please, I'm Sandra Hadden. Please, my question goes to Dr. Preisler. Please, I was asking if, uh, as media youth, we have ideas, business ideas, and you know that, oh, maybe you don't have money to finance these things. So you intend to go to maybe a private sector or any stakeholders that you know they could be of support. But later, you are scared that maybe the idea that you have people who are in the higher uh, institutions tend to take advantage of we, those that we barely know what we are about. So they try to steal the idea you have. So how do you then deal with this thing? Because maybe you have the idea, but you don't know how you go about it. What if the person you are moving to steals the idea you have and end up, you end up com coming out with nothing? So I wanted to know if, how do you go about this as a youth to do these things? And my second question is, if she has people she's mentoring or something, how then do we, the youth, get to join or something that anything Great, so um, theft of ideas um, and then mentoring. Uh, so Dr. Whistler, Chief Mr. Bafo, that's for you. Um, the next one. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much for your wonderful um, lessons you have taught us about volunteerism and employment. Um, I'm actually a volunteer enthusiast. I'm actually into a lot of volunteering. I've had some couple of experience since I was in high school. And so far, I would say volunteering has really been very helpful. But my question is, um, I see like the example uh, Madame gave, like I don't know who said it, that when graduates are done with their school and they are ready to go into the workforce, you see companies coming and looking for people to employ, for instance, and get them. So my question is like, how can we balance like um, the idea of volunteering as well as not exploiting the youth? Because you see there are some youth who are really ready to work and they have the skills, they are passionate, they are ready to give in their all. And it gets to the point that they really try to do their best but when opportunities come for these youth to grow and help them to take them to the other level, when those times come, you don't get, you don't get to even hear about those opportunities. They, they tend to look for people with higher qualification or higher certification because maybe they don't have much years of experience, but they have been doing the work. So like, how do you tackle that issue? Great. So I think, um, Dr. Bafo, you take that one um, about the theft of ideas and then mentorship and then Mama, you take the other one for us about volunteering. Okay, thank you. On the issue of um, people stealing your ideas, yes, young people are, are, are filled with great ideas and 
Um, it said that it's great to be young because when you are young, you have the opportunity to explore, make mistakes, and um, you have the time to correct them as and when. And so if you have um, great ideas, what you probably would have to sit down to do is to work through your ideas, think through carefully, and um, look at how um, your idea can be um, effectively developed into a marketable concept, right? So a, a marketable concept, you are looking at the profitability, the scalability of it and all that. Once you do and you begin to go around looking for uh, people to pitch your idea with, you always have to bear in mind that yes, there is the likelihood that um, someone will steal your idea. So when you are pitching your idea, you don't totally sell everything. Right, I believe that entrepreneurs um, would tell you that you have to keep a core of some of the things to yourself. Um, so for example, what is the secret to making uh, this crispy um, chicken that KFC does? It's been ages, but the recipe is with just a few people um, and all that. So, but that's just the, the terrain you are in. When you are young, people would want to take advantage of you. Um, but you need to be careful not to be too trusting as a young person. And so that you explore. You can also look at opportunities that exist within the, the public space. Um, I know that Ghana Enterprises Agency, for example, um, has a number of initiatives that support startups. So instead of probably approaching private people, um, you could start from there. Um, I don't know if people in public service would also steal your idea. But what, whenever you are pitching your idea, you always have to make sure that you keep some core critical ones to yourself. That's even if the people run with it, they may not necessarily have a prototype of what you have. On the issue of um, mentorship, um, the way we do it is through um, mentoring our students, for example. And so um, through their training, um, I get to meet them. Um, those that would end up doing their national service in the department who serve under us, um, we get some um, mentorship in that area. But because we are an um, academic institution, we tend to find that our mentorship is towards those who are towing the academic line. Uh, maybe as time goes on, we need to divert, but I also do not have a lot of experience in, um, what do we call it, uh, industry. The fact that I am I'm teaching does not know that does not mean that I know everything. So you always have to go in a space where you are familiar with, obviously. So before um, Marco, you come in, um, Will, I want to bring you in because I, I hear you will be going soon. Um, what opportunities exist for young people who need mentorship? Since um, uh, Dr. Chimes was talking about. What are the opportunities that exist, or how can young people really find the kind of mentorship and education that can build them up? Because sometimes you leave school and you have to upskill. And we're talking about the upskill struggle. So what are, what are the things or the opportunities that young people can do to really upskill and help them to put them ahead uh, when it comes to finding a job or setting up their own um, enterprises? to Priscilla and, and Morco for sharing a, a panel today. I've learned such a lot from them and uh, really enjoyed the questions as well. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'll have to um, drop off after, um, after concluding uh, these remarks. And perhaps if I just go back a step as well and um, capture some of the other questions that were asked earlier on. Um, I think entrepreneurship is so important to um, finding uh, a solution to the youth employment crisis um, that uh, Ghana and many other countries faces. Um, the, the demographic pressures are, are well understood, um, but simply mean that um, there will, uh, although there are skill shortages um, in both the formal and informal economy, uh, there will not be enough 
uh, vacancies for all the young people um, who are reaching um, the stage to join the labour market. I think the figure of 210,000 uh, a year was mentioned earlier. And so I think what that means is that, um, uh, and this is obviously well understood, that entrepreneurship is an absolutely critical part of young people's passageway into work, uh, both creating jobs for themselves and hopefully for their peers as well. And so um, th this question about what should young people do to prepare themselves for the world of work, um, perhaps when they're struggling to find employment, I think volunteering is an absolutely critical part of that and will help expose young people to um, working in organisations and uh, seeing uh, uh, the, the world, but, but also entrepreneurship, spending some time uh, developing your own uh, skills in a specific area, uh, developing a business idea, um, starting to test that out, developing a minimal viable product, not seeing it purely as a hustle, but as a potential um, career pathway. Um, and critical to that um, is, of course, mentors. Um, and uh, in, in our experience um, as a, an organisation developing youth employment programmes right around the world, um, mentoring is absolutely critical to um, you know, many of our programmes and we don't struggle to find uh, people in the economy who want to act as a mentor. I think um, you know, people get so much from mentoring a young person. And so my advice to young people would be, um, first of all, see if you can find programs that provide that formal mentoring support. But if you can't, or if they're oversubscribed, then identify people who impress you, people uh, who have um, pursued careers that you want to emulate and uh, reach out to them. Um, and uh, you'll be surprised, I think, by how the, the simple flattery of your interest in what they've done um, will open people up to wanting to support you. So I think you know that, that entrepreneurship is certainly critical in terms of developing business ideas, but also in uh, uh, creating a pathway for, uh, for yourself. And, uh, and I'd encourage young people to take that initiative uh, as well as um, seeking programs uh, that have a more formal aspect to dimension. Um, so just conclude by saying, you know, what a great pleasure it has been to, to join all of you today. Thank you very much for taking an interest in the um, work of Prince's Trust International um, and in our Upskill Struggle uh, report, um, which uh, you can download. I shared a link in the chat earlier on. Uh, and of course, uh, big, big thanks to uh, Eric Prosper and Emmanuel and the whole team at Yotta for um, organising this uh, fascinating event today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will. Please give a hand for Will, for me. Yes. Um, so thank you very much, Will, for joining us. And um, we understand you need to leave out. So thank you for your uh, word. I would I'd like to ask one question, but I'll throw it to the uh, team here, and then they will take it out for me. But before then, uh, Malco, there was the issue about volunteering. And you volunteer your time with an organization, and the opportunity comes, and then they look at you, they look at someone else, and they give it to that person. <laughs> well, what can I say? Take it that you are developing your own capacity. Because if that organization doesn't take you on, you still have the skill and it's yours. And you can use that skill to apply to another organization. So that shouldn't discourage you from volunteering. And as you build your, your skills, you build your capacity, remember that you are adding to your own value. And so that is something you can sell. And at the point where you have built enough capacity, you realize that wherever you enter, you are placed at the right level where you are rewarded adequately. And so I think that should not be our disposition. We should be ready to volunteer, irrespective of whether we would be taken or will not be taken on. We are saying we are adding value to ourselves. I would also want to advocate that even with our training institutions, if we can come up with some programs where we are working with the employers, and so together we come up with uh, ideas on, okay, let's do this. This is the way we, we want to train our, our people. When they come out, this is where, if they meet the requirements, this is where they enter. 
And so young people would at the same time have the backing of their institutions, for example. If our training institutions can also go in that direction, that will also help to kind of secure um, the young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when you come to the Skills Hub, the Skills Hub has um, seizing mentors and then trainers who are able to support you through your journey. And so if you have an idea um, that you want to develop and all that, you come and then you, um, you are supported. We have what we call the monthly Skills Hub chats. And, and at our last chat, we had the man from Chicken, Chicken Man. And he said something that stuck with me. He said that when you come up with ideas in Ghana, um, you find 10 other people having the same idea, but what makes yours unique in there? And so you should be able to couch and prepare your idea and then really go with your idea in a more unique way that you have a niche that nobody else has that puts you ahead um, in there. The conversation is getting richer, but I know our time is also catching um, up with us. Um, and so, really, from all that we've discussed, um, let's take it first from the young people's perspective. Where should they start from? Or where should they be continuing from? And um, with this discussion of really upskilling um, themselves, because we're seeing that you, you leave um, your institution, the educational institutions, and you need to really build up certain skills, how to send emails, how to really use technology, and all that. And these days, there are a lot of free educational um, facilities and opportunities, even online, a number of scholarships and all that. But it seems that they are not enough, or the young people are not finding it, or I don't know what it is. So where should we really start from for the young people, Dr. Chimis Bafo? Okay, so um, as a young person, I would say that invest in yourself. Know your shortfalls. If you have graduated from a tertiary institution, it is still not late. If you are in it, invest in yourself. How do you do that? Um, invest in your soft skills. So the hard skills are the ones that you are being taught in the educational system. The other skills, nobody teaches you. You have to figure it out yourself. Um, unfortunately, some of them you should have been taught at the primary, secondary level, but because of the way our educational system is organized, not a lot of people get the opportunity. So what are some of these soft skills, for example? You're talking about communication skills. How you communicate is the window to the world, right? So you meet somebody, your first impression, your appearance, your communication. Um, young people here, if I should ask, um, this year, how many books have you read? The young people in this room. How many books have you read this year? We are yes, in the eighth one. month. Soft copy or hard copy. <laughs> regardless, regardless, we are, we are in the eighth month of the year. How many books have you read? Anybody? If you've read 10 books, we have a okay. prize for so you. Okay, so I think I have, I have one person. So you see, the, the culture of reading is becoming a problem, and it is gradually being extinct, if, if you ask me. Children are holding tablets, phones, and things. So now you pick a book, and it's like, and the Nobel um, Prize winner for literature, um, he made a, she made a very profound statement that... Um, People in literature, you don't get experts in literature that come from homes that there are no books, right? So the foundation of everything we are talking about, the foundation of your communication skills is the book you read. You are what you read. Um, you could pick important things. You could pick people's biography. We are talking about mentorship. Read biography of great people. How did they do it? Where did they come from? Those things will inspire you. You aim to be like them. But as you keep on reading, people are buying data and listening to a whole lot of influencers. So in my class, I also ask those of you on Twitter, Instagram, where, which people do you follow? 
Right. Which people do you follow? So if, and you know that these days, even when you go for job interviews, you mention your name, and a panel can Google your name, check which, I mean, go through your Twitter, find out your thought process, because you are what you put out there. Right. So these are important. You need to um, have an end goal. Right. You have a target of where you want to be. And you need to organize your life in such a way that you reach it at that point. Issues of emails. Honestly, sometimes you receive emails from students and you're like, wow. They, they talk to you like they are, they are writing to their peers. Right. The moment you sit behind an, uh, an email, know that, and one thing you should take also with you is that whatever you put in writing can always be referred. Right. So you sit behind, a young person will send you an email, or you send an email talking about things and explaining things to them and all that, and the response you get is thanks. <laughs> Honestly, the response is thanks. There is no salutation for the email. There is no sign out. I mean, these are basic etiquettes, and these are soft skills that you develop. Nobody teaches you, but you need to figure it out. So you cannot go and be blaming your lecturers for not teaching you how to send an email, for not teaching you um, some of these basic things. When it comes to teamwork, how do you collaborate in your group? I think the time is quite short. But indeed, these are issues. So you can go and Google um, what sort of skill sets. And from today, make an effort to every day invest in yourself, invest in your soft skills. And that is what will make a difference between you and the so many other people who are also holding the same certificates that you are holding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for the talk. Right, um, and so you, you'd see that if we have 210,000 young people getting into the labor market every year, development, and there's something we call continuous professional development. That continuous professional development is in your own hands. And so you take it um, and then you work with it. Right. And so whilst we look at what we can do as young people, what can industry and the private sector do to really inspire us um, to really get in there? What can they do to support and then inspire us, Malco? What can we do? Like even the World Bank and other institutions, what should they be doing to inspire young people in there? Okay, this is a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that industry, all the other partners, stakeholders out there see the urgent need to really support the youth now because it's becoming a um, high priority. Uh, as we speak, the reports are saying by 2035 would have the population of Ghana would have like half of it would be people under 25 years. And so we need to really pay attention to supporting our youth to pick up the gaps. At the same time, we also need to get the youth to be on board. I think that the youth should be center stage. They should help to influence programming by organizations. Because sometimes uh, we think that, okay, we know what is going on. But then when we sit around the table with the key stakeholders, especially the youth, get to hear them, understand what the real issues are, then that can be used to guide our uh, programming. Whether it's the World Bank, it's the, uh, the government, it's other development partners. I think we need to collectively start doing that kind of programming where we respond directly to the needs of the youth. 
Aside that, we also need to create incentives for private sector to see their role in this whole uh, milieu. They need to come on board and we have to find ways to bring them on board. Because for private sector, they are profit making. If <laughs> they bring you on board and you are not contributing to their productivity, I mean, it, it's not helpful for them. But at the same time, we need them around the table to also contribute to this whole process. So government sh should help to create some incentives for the private sector to see themselves as part of this process and open up to also contribute. Great. Thank and you. that actually takes us into government in terms of the policies that they can put in place um, that would support and enable young people to really obtain that. So, so Dr. Chumas Bafo, what, what are some of the policy recommendations that um, we can see or we, government should really consider um, for young people? Okay, so um, in that regard, I think that we need to get back to basics and look at our educational reform from the primary school to the secondary school. Indeed, by the time people get to the tertiary, it is getting a bit late um, because uh, most of the skills, if they are not doing it themselves. So for example, we talk about digital skills. Um, how are we um, educating young people from primary one to primary six? Uh, do they have digital education as part of their training, ICT? Do they have the equipment? It requires a lot of resources. But you find that within the educational space, this, the, what do we call it, discussion about educational reforms. I know recently there is, um, what do we call it, a new curriculum that is trying to adapt to changing trends. But there is a lot of investment that needs to go in there. So that at the end of the day, when people come out of um, primary, secondary education, um, they are equipped with some basic skills because indeed the emphasis should be after secondary school people should be equipped with skills that they can enter the labor market and get good jobs. The tertiary education, it's now becoming more like a normal routine to finish university. But those days when companies were queuing, it was a few that were going on to tertiary. Why? Because you could get a decent job with secondary education. And I think that particularly with, I mean, policies like um, free SHS where everybody is going, we need not pretend to be educating them. We have to give them the requisite skills that are needed so that people graduate from SHS and they can get good jobs because they are able to, they are equipped with the requisite skills, good communication skills, good digital skills, some basics because when you go to the tertiary, then you are moving into more specialized areas. And I think that government should make a lot more effort particularly in investments in infrastructure and the human resource that is required along the educational value chain to make sure that the graduates that come out um, are comparable anywhere in the world. Thank Great. you. And so how do we get this uh, on the forefront of government's agenda? How do we, we know that if government wants to do something like the free um, SHS or free education, they do that. But Marco, you spoke about government helping private sector and all that. And so as we're celebrating International Youth Day, what can we do to really put this, it, it, this one thing having a policy and it's one thing actually implementing that policy. How can we make government prioritize a policy that supports young people to get into employment or find their own enterprises and run it? Okay, so I think we need to do a lot of advocacy, and especially for, uh, for organizations like yourself, YOTA, that is really at the forefront of youth-related work. You need to advocate more, to engage with government. Um, government would work with different stakeholders, so long as the stakeholders are available, would we'll 
pick up the key issues to address and that will guide them in their planning processes. So I think that NGOs, civil society, uh, organizations, um, academia, all the stakeholders should engage more with governments, bringing up the issues that need to be addressed. I would also want to say that in terms of the policy, um, government is doing quite well with um, the TVET, promoting TVET lately. Um, in our side of the world, or in this country, we tend to uh, look down on the TVET space. But it's a very, very huge area where, I mean, if you are talented with those skills, you could do well. And elsewhere, they even have a um, progressive framework where you could, within the TV sector, you could rise to be at the doctorate level. So government is trying to introduce that here in Ghana such that the perception that, oh, when I go, I'm a, a dressmaker, I, I, I do hair, or I'm a carpenter, and I'm nobody. We realize that lately the youth is thinking that, oh, there are some areas that are menial. I wouldn't want to go in that direction. But then at the same time, there are opportunities within those areas, and we need to explore them. So. I like the way government is now promoting the TV sector so that we all see it as a potential area that we can explore and invest in. Great. Actually, I was at a TVET event, and they said something that struck me, and I mm -hmm. want to actually do the same thing with you. They said, look around you. Just take a look around you. Um, everything you see is a, re a result of TVET. So the microphone is a TVET. The chair I'm sitting on is TVET. The tablet I'm holding, the TV, the cameraman, what you're sitting on, what you're wearing, it's all TVET. And they're making money. And so if you want money, where do you go? <laughs> all right. I don't want to do um, others in the audience who have questions at the service. And so I want to open up another round of questions from the audience and then see um, where we can go with that. Okay, so... Good afternoon, Dr. Priscilla. Good afternoon, Madam. I've really um, had a quite, I've had quite an insightful moment and a lot of aha moments. And I also felt like there are a couple of things that were slipping in me that have been awakened. So now my question is, I'm trying to wear um, some shoes of some of my colleagues on campus. So my name is Queen Marjana too. And talking about menial job, I'm a proud uh, menial worker. I call myself a jewelry surgeon. <laughs> So, I have a couple of friends on campus who uh, maybe you invite them for programs and when it's not like um, maybe a school time, maybe it's during vacations, they tell you things like, oh, I cannot attend because uh, in my house, um, I can't come home after five o'clock. And maybe some of these events are like a little bit late nights. So my question now is about how do such people draw the curtain between um, staying true to your um, future and your career and then respect for parents. And then I feel like this can actually be looked at from a holistic angle because sometimes people's parents kind of contribute negatively to how their career dimensions go to. So I would like to know what advice you would like to give to such people and how they can, you know, wake up from their parents' umbrella and then grab their future by themselves. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. So let me try and answer you. Um, I'm also a parent. So what I would say is, as a student, I mean, you should get to that point where you engage your parents on what you want to do unless you are not clear yourself on where you, you want to go in terms of your uh, aspirations. 
So once you, you engage your parents on what you want to do, be able to convince them about the value of going out to such places. Of course, there's another element to it, which is about trust. Because your, your parents should be able to trust that you going out there, you're really going out that program. And so it's a responsibility on your side to engage with your parents, unless that discussion hasn't happened about what you aspire to become then your parents will find it difficult to allow you go out at any time. So there are different elements to what you're saying. You should be able to, to build that trust with your parents, share what you want to do, share the value of like, participating in those events. And then I think every parent is a level-headed work around. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Isaac Kwashi, and uh, I want to thank uh, Madam Maoko for that impressive, you know, uh, submission she she made with, with respect to the TVET program. Uh, I believe the government has done enough in terms of sensitization, sensitizing the youth to enter into T TVET programs. I believe that if all the youth will, you know, uh, marshal their resources and enter into TVET. I believe that our nation will bounce back in terms of the economy. But uh, one thing I have noticed, the one trend I've noticed, is that you know, there have been a lot of stakeholder engagements in the area of promoting TVET. And uh, a lot of uh, industry pl players or companies have also advocated for uh, this TVET program to yield fruit. But uh, you know, all these interventions are not really working out, are not really uh, uh, pushing the youth into that aspect of, of, of the training process. So, uh, Madam Malko, if, uh, I'll be more grateful if you can also, if you have any idea or any other alternative which will encourage we, the youth, to also see the need to actually enter into the TVET program, I'll be most grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, my name is Joshua. I'll just focus on uh, tourism. And Dr. Prisla, I remember 2021, uh, you and uh, Dr. Botexin did a paper on uh, tourism and the employment in the country. One of the best papers I've read. I want to know whether there is a track for employment in the tourism area. Whether, based on your paper that we've done, we want to see whether government is able to achieve some of the research things that you said in your paper. Thank you. So I think now for the first one was to you about um, the TVET. Um, and how young people can be encouraged, right, um, and supported to enter into TVET. Okay, so we need to get rid of that perception that TVET is for those who didn't do well. And that is not true. I mean, most of us, I know in Ghana, that's a kind of mindset that people who go into TVET didn't do well and could not progress uh, further in their, their education ladder, so they diverted and went into TVET. But it isn't true. I think that isn't true. If we are all given the opportunity to do what we really want to do. I mean, if you identify that you have a certain skill and you want to develop it, irrespective of whether you have a doctorate, 
you still go out there and try to develop that skill. I must say that even as I sit here, I have a small business and I make soaps. I make body creams. That is TVET. And so I don't see it as demeaning. I don't see it. It adds value to me as a person. So I would encourage everyone to just be open-minded. If you identify that you are very good in an area and you want to develop it, you can have a parallel. I work as a consultant, and I also have a small business. So you can grow both at the same time. It is possible to do that. So please, let's, let's get rid of the idea that TVET is for people who do not do well. Definitely. You. you can have a side hustle, as we say it yes. as young people. Your side hustle that you can really grow it. And even if you don't have any TVET skill, um, there's something we call recognition of prior learning. And so you can actually do an informal TVET training for about six months with uh, now the Ghana TVET service. You get your certificate, you get a proficiency one certificate, and you can start doing something um, with it as well in there. And so if you go to the Ghana TVET service website, or even if you go to the place, you'll be able to find something um, to do. And you can come to the Skills Hub where we have our coaches and counselors who can support you through the process. So, Doc, let's talk about the tourism sector, employment opportunities and COVID. Okay, so um, with my background in education, I think the TVET is also important um, to me. And um, with um, issues of, of TVET, like Mauko indicated, it's, it's historically, it's been like, yeah, you go to school, you don't do well, then go and learn how to do carpentry or sewing or whatever. But these days, it's, it's changing. And um, I think that we need continuous education. And the whole idea is also the um, remuneration scheme out there. There is no standard um, scheme. I know that the standards authority is doing something like that. So that, for example, if you call a plumber, we all know the amount of money you have to pay, which is a decent amount um, that these people can also live good lives. And trust me, a lot of people are, are making good living out of in the TV space. And what makes the difference is the soft skills that they have added to the job they are doing. I know an electrician that when we call him, he comes, packs his car, sort out the issue, and you can rely on him that the job is done. This is somebody who completed the polytechnic, right? The job is done. He does a professional job. And I'm like, wow, there are a crop of electricians that are coming up like that. There are a crop of plumbers that are doing professional jobs. Have you asked yourself, why do some people queue to sew from one particular individual who takes about a thousand CDs for a dress? And they still do not even find time to meet targets with demands from customers. What are they doing differently? When you go through, it is education that is making that difference. So if you have the opportunity to learn and you are at the same time gifted within the TV space, um, then the sky is the limit for you. And probably those people are also contributing to us changing the narrative about the TV space. On the issue of the tourism paper we did, yes. Um, we made that projection, but we, we've seen that we know that the potential in tourism is enormous. The, the sector faces a number of challenges, and COVID honestly rolled back a lot of the, the gains that we made through um, the Ghana, sorry, the year of return, exactly, the year of return. So after we ended the year of return, there was another program, and then COVID hit in 2020, March. Um, but as the sector recovers, we know that um, there's a lot of potential um, that exists in there. From the time people land at the airports, 
till they leave, all the things they do in Ghana and all that would um, come mainly under tourism. I'm talking about foreigners who come in here. Um, so the opportunities exist. The data is challenging because, I mean, as we speak, we don't have up-to-date data on employment by sector. Even the overall employment numbers, it has to take whether the census or the periodic Ghana Living Standards Survey for us to get an idea of employment and unemployment numbers. Um, but I believe that as we evolve and a lot of investment goes in there, and then the data can inform the policy as, as the way to go. But indeed, the opportunities do exist. I mean, when you travel elsewhere to East Africa and all that, what does it take, for example, to be a tour guide? Right, you go to Cape Coast Castle. I mean, people have good jobs. They do not require tertiary education to be able to do that. And these are all jobs that can be created. You go to Boti Falls, you go to, you see that sometimes the place is deserted. You don't find anybody guiding you, anybody giving you historical perspective of the place and all that. And these are all opportunities that exist within that ecosystem that we believe that young people can move in there with the support of government obviously taking the lead, yes. Great, um, I think we, I am enjoying the conversation and I can go on and on because I have a thousand of questions to ask, but we have to bring it to an end. So. Just one final thought from you. Um, if there's one thing that young people should take away from this conversation, what should it be, really? So this question is to both of you. Let's start with you, Marco. If young people should take something, one thing, out of this conversation as we celebrate and commemorate um, International Youth Day, what should it be? Okay, thank you. So I think that should be build your capacity. Invest in building your capacity. Even whilst in school, you could do holiday jobs so you can acquire some experience, work experience. Um, somehow in our part of the world, um, we can't combine schooling and work, sort of. But elsewhere, you can be schooling and at the same time, you can do some part-time job that will bring you some sm small income at the same time you are also building some skills. So let's invest in uh, building our own capacity because no one will do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for America. Yes, Dr. Bafo, what one, one thing that young people should take from this conversation. Okay, I think I, I totally support Malko's point. When you are young, it is the time for investment. You invest in yourself to reap it at a future date. So at this point, it is all about investing in your capabilities, investing so that you are equipped to set yourself apart and know that the world has increasingly become very competitive. So you need to invest in yourself to make sure that you are set apart from the crowd, right? Today, jobs in Ghana could be done by people anywhere, right? So you have Google setting up here. Um, you have people applying all over. So the fact that they are in Ghana, that Yes, you are competing with people globally. And when you have that in mind, it means that at any point in time, you need to be finding opportunities to educate yourself to get the edge above those in the pack. So investment in yourself is critical in the area of education. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Please continue to clap. Continue clapping. Clap, 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 clap. Thank you so much. What I have learned is that upskilling is a struggle, but it's my responsibility as a young person to invest in myself and build that skill in there. Um, and I think that's what we have learned. I'd like to apologize to our online um, 
audience that we couldn't take much questions from them. We've seen some of your questions. We'll respond to them um, later. But we'd like to invite you to join us at the Skills Hub and the next Skills Hub chat as we are going to have it. And we'll continue with the conversation in commemorating the International Youth Day. And so once again, I want to say a very, 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 very big thank you. We can thank you enough um, to Dr. Presla Chumesiba for from University of Ghana and to Marco Fumi from um, the World Bank. We really, really appreciate you. Please give it up once again for our audience um, in there. Um, we brought our session to an end, and so we will exit the stage and then I'll hand over um, the microphone to um, Prosper. Thank you so very much once again. Thank you, Eric. I didn't want this session to end, honestly. I wish we could continue again, but we have to end. So we would actually have our closing, and then towards the end, I have some information to share with all of you. We'd like to welcome, with a resounding round of applause, Professor Joseph Kocho Tufo, the board chair of IOTA to give us a closing remarks. All right. Thank you very much for... Thank you very much for uh, this. And, uh, I welcome all of you to Yota, those who are participating in our activities for the first time. But uh, for you, it is just the beginning. You are always welcome to the various activities that uh, Yota has been organizing and will continue to do. And so don't let this be the first time of participating in the activities of, of Yota, particularly our panel members who uh, probably uh, will be the first time of coming to our skills hub and all that. Um, for, for us as Yota, this is an opportunity to continue the discussions on how we can make the youth uh, employable, how the youth can improve upon their skills and add the various soft skills that they need in the world of work. And so that is what uh, we have been doing and will continue to do and to see the youth of Ghana and not only those uh, in Ghana, but also across the sub-region, develop so they can make meaningful contributions to their various countries uh, beyond themselves. Uh, today, we have uh, had a nice discussion on, on upscaling of skills. Um, from experience uh, of traveling around a few countries and also what I've seen so far, it is uh, one of the areas that will make you stand out. So if you have the normal degree, normal certificate, I mean, when I read your CV, what should be something that is different from your Bachelor of Science, HND? There should be something that uh, stands out. And that is why these conversations are important. Today we uh, have uh, been through this process of getting ideas and what to do and also to uh, look at what lies ahead. Uh, the coming in of COVID has taught us a lesson uh, in terms of what we should do in addition to getting up, waking up, driving to the office or going to the office. Uh, there are new ways now that we should begin to look at uh, what uh, we need to do so that we can upskill uh, our new set we, we have. We have listened to our panel members and there are a few things that are key that they indicated. For instance, one that I picked from Dr. Prisla is about going back to the basis, uh, which uh, requires that we should collaborate to do more. And that is why Yota is at the forefront of youth development trying to do uh, this type of things so that we can collaborate with other development partners, institutions, uh, the public sector institutions to be able 
to do uh, this. Uh, in that respect, looking at the educational system is key. And uh, that also requires that individuals should take their responsibility. If your program, for instance, at the educational level uh, does not include acquisition of soft skills, for instance, there are other options that you could take. And Yota uh, is offering such opportunities through our skills hub where you can come over and then learn and also participate in such activities. Um, we also um, heard from our World Bank representative uh, this morning talking about the private sector uh, trying to modify their ways and how they need to be flexible. Uh, in the one way that that can be done is not to wait so the people have been trained somewhere or somehow before you utilize them. But you can also, uh, the private sector can usually contribute uh, in achieving uh, this. We also um, heard from the PTI uh, chief executive uh, withdraw talking about the role of soft skills in general uh, in trying to uh, develop uh, the youth and, and, and uh, youth uh, development is at the center of IOTA. And so if I summarize um, in few, one key word from each of these panel members, I think that that's what I can say in respect of all the various uh, new knowledge, uh, those of us in economics can talk about new knowledge, the new knowledge that you've taken from here, uh, beyond what I've indicated. I know you are going to make you good use of them uh, going forward. On that note, uh, on behalf of Yota, the council members and all the team, we want to thank the uh, panel members for their time that they have allocated for us to uh, Marco Fume uh, from the World Bank Group for uh, giving us your knowledge and your time. We want to thank Dr. Plisla Chumesi, uh, also from the Department of Economics, where I also studied, uh, for giving us uh, her thoughts, and also the Chief Executive Officer for PTI for joining us uh, through online to contribute uh, in this. Um, we also want to thank um, Eric for doing a good job. Uh, and uh, we also, on behalf of the board, want to thank you, participants, uh, both physically, those who joined, and also those who joined uh, virtually. I hope this is not going to be the end of your uh, participation in your test work uh, so that you continue to build your skills. Uh, so that when we are off the scene, somebody who also standing and do what I'm doing in the next 20 years, that he, was, he or she was part of. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should take it as, as something that 20 years, Yota is growing. participating in uh, your test uh, activity. And this will not be the end, but let's continue the discussion on your test uh, various platforms for the discussion, the chat, uh, and all the uh, available channels that we can continue our discussion. And so don't let it end. You can pass over. Your test doors are open. Our skills hub and all our activities are there uh, geared towards enhancing the development of, of the youth. Uh, uh, we want to thank all the team that participated and contributed in getting this done, the back, uh, the back end uh, staff members and all those that uh, helped. So on my own behalf as the board chair and also uh, the team from uh, Utah, we want to thank you for being part of this great initiative and it's not going to be the end as we are going to proceed from here to do more so that we see all of you, your skills developed uh, either when you are employed by the formal sector or by yourself, you have new skills that you utilize so that your business will not collapse so that when you are employed, you show really that you are coming in with excellence and not only the qualification that you hold, but you have something meaningful to contribute to each organization or whatever organization that you'll be engaged with. On that note, thank you very much for being part of this. So I hand over. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dr. Tufo has a very nice way of putting it. Thank you so much. 
So for those of us joining virtually, let's continue the conversation. On this note, we would like to say thank you to all of you for coming in. Uh, information for those in is we have something for all of you here. So once we are done, we'll attend to all of you. Um, my name is Prosper Tony, and I have been the host for this year's International Youth Day. When we are done, we'll take pictures uh, and then we'll exit and celebrate the day. Keep up with the good work as a young person. So for the pictures, we will do the panelists right after we'll stand here and then take a picture. Then once we are done, we'll do a group photo and then the Yota team members will join for us to take the last picture. So the first set of pictures will be the panelists with the um, with Prof, and then the second picture will be a group picture with the panelists and everyone. So if the photographers are ready, let's do a quick one with the panelists right here.